On April 15th, 2009, I blew into a machine and it told me I had a chronic medical disorder. And I was ecstatic. I couldn't have been happier. For 18 months, I'd been going to doctors and specialists. I'd been fed pills, and I'd had test after test done. And by this time, I had had so much blood work taken that I would avoid wearing short sleeve shirts. It was around this time, when my doctor seemed to be out of options, that my outlook towards the situation changed. I decided I wasn't going to be a passive patient anymore, simply waiting around for a diagnosis. Maybe this wasn't necessarily my doctor's problem to solve. It was mine. Now, I'm a computer programmer. I understand things logically and rationally. Ones and zeros, that's my world. And I've also spent the last 15 years of my life debugging things that don't work the way they should. I thought, maybe my body's like the hardware and the software is broken. The chemistry is wrong. I started like most people would with these online diagnosing tools. Most of you have probably used them before. If not, here's how they work. You enter your symptoms and they tell you you have cancer. It doesn't matter what the input is, that's always in the output. I remember night after night, checking checkboxes, you know, answering questions, and that was always in the result. And that's actually pretty scary. Uh, when the internet starts telling you that and you feel the way you do, um, I won't speak for you, but for me, I, I actually started to uh, freak out a little bit. Computer programmers, we have a couple tricks. There's a couple things that we know. Number one, <clears throat> if something isn't working right, it's usually the things going into it uh, that's causing it to misbehave, whether that's bad code or bad data. Uh, the second thing that we do is we monitor as much as we can so that we know when you change something, what the result is, what, what happened. There's a couple inputs into our lives. There's food, uh, there's sleep, uh, there's exercise. So I explored all of those. With the help of a naturopath and a nutritionist, I came up with a very strict diet plan. For six weeks, I ate nothing but unseasoned chicken, a little bit of salmon, brown rice, and a limited set of fruits and vegetables. Three weeks in, I would have killed somebody for a cup of coffee. I would have loved to have a chocolate chip, but I didn't, because to me, to my logical mind, that would introduce an unknown variable that would nullify my tests, so I didn't. I went from 145 pounds down to 115 pounds and probably started to look as bad as I felt. But something amazing happened. I started to feel worse. <laughs> worse. <laughs> now, most people would think that's a bad thing, but it's not. That was great. After seeing doctors and psychologists and specialists, after having scans and scopes and ultrasounds, and after being trying medication after medication, I finally found something that changed my symptoms. It was as though something that up to this point seemed permanent was now pliable. This fueled my urge to research as much as I could about food and food illnesses and intolerances and allergies. <clears throat> I'd spend every waking minute, every free second that I had, reading Wikipedia articles or medical journals or blogs, really whatever I could get my hands on, and I would read them, and I would cross-reference them, and I would read them again and again until I understood them. Because I knew at this point that maybe the problem wasn't what my body was doing to me, but what I was doing to my body. I came across a possible diagnosis, something called fructose malabsorption. So fructose is uh, fruit sugars. All the symptoms seemed to fit, and um, the other thing that seemed to fit was um, I was having these weird erratic mood swings. I would get very easily irritated at the smallest thing, which wasn't like me at all. Um, that uh, to be honest, was taking a toll on my relationships with my wife, 
with my friends, with my family, with my children. Um, so fructose. Um, most people would think that's fruit. You avoid fruit. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about fructose. So fructose, yes, it's in fruit. It's very high in tree fruits. So that's apples, pears, peaches, cherries, nectarines, plums. Um, it's also quite high in melons. Um, and to a lesser degree, citrus fruits. Um, berries are actually okay. There's very little fructose in berries. Um, having a problem with fructose, though, you also have to avoid something called fructans. And fructans are chains of fructose molecules. And they don't taste sweet, but uh, they still have to be avoided. Um, fructans are in wheat. So if anybody knows somebody who follows a celiac diet or a gluten-free diet, um, any wheat products. It's also in brown rice. It's in some sort of random fruits and vegetables, uh, such as onions, asparagus, garlic, carrots, green beans, some other things, which ironically were most of the foods I was eating on this six-week diet. A little hesitant, I took this information to my doctor, and he had no idea what I was talking about. He had been practicing medicine at this point for almost 40 years, and he had never heard of fructose malabsorption before. For 15 minutes, we had this conversation where it at first went from just talking about how most people would talk about your symptoms and how you, f you felt, to all this information that I had learned, all this technical information about how proton pump inhibitors wouldn't work and how, how uh, electrocytes in your upper intestine act on different things and how glucose receptors absorb fructose. And for 15 minutes, my doctor took notes. It was a very sort of surreal, weird um, exchange where you're teaching your doctor something. I also told him the test that was needed to confirm a diagnosis, um, something called a hydrogen breath test. And uh, he said they had a machine at the hospital that could do that, and he would book me a test. It's the same uh, machine that they use to test for lactose intolerance. Now, I was fortunate that my doctor encouraged me to pursue this information that I had found, and that he was able to book me this test. Um, but I did have a backup plan. In my web browser at home, I had bookmarked a place where from Kansas I could order my own hydrogen breath testing machine for about $3,000 plus shipping and handling. As a software developer, uh, we would call that exception handling. <laughs> exception handling is if something goes wrong, you have a backup plan. Uh, so to me, this didn't seem weird. This just seemed like a logical thing to do. A few weeks later, I show up at the hospital, and the nurse greets me. She says, hi, Brent. Okay, we're going to hook you up to this machine to see if you have lactose intolerance. I said, that's fine, but I need to do the test with fructose. It was like I threw her a curveball. You could tell she has been doing the same thing for a long time, and somebody just told her something different. So she gave me this weird look, said, I'll be right back. She left. <laughs> Half an hour later, she comes back in and says, OK, uh, we're going to give you lactose, hook you up to this machine, check the hydrogen in your breath. So that's fine, um, but I think I might have something called fructose malabsorption, so I need to do this test with fructose. She gave me the same funny look, said, I'll be right back, and she left again. <laughs> About half an hour later, she came back in and said, we don't have fructose. I said, I figured you wouldn't hear, I brought some. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, used it to test myself, so I would take various amounts and see how I felt. So the story works out. She, she's able to bring the fructose to the pharmacist, they probably look up on Wikipedia what to do. <laughs> um, they, they, they come with the right quantities, and, and we're able to, to do the test, which is, which is great. Um, the testing takes five hours. So five hours, sort of discomfort. And, but, um, so we, we do the tests. And 
after five hours, I see it. It's this crude dot matrix printout that the machine produces that has a graph that goes like this, with the blue bar where I should be and this red bar where I am. And it tells me one thing. I had an answer. And it was my answer. It wasn't my doctor's answer. I had figured it out. When I was preparing for this talk, um, my wife said that the most memorable part of this story for her was the smile on my face when I came home that day, saying, I have a chronic medical disorder. <laughs> <laughs> and I really was overjoyed because after all this time, I, I had my answer. That was four years ago, but uh, the story doesn't end there. Since then, I've set up online communities and tools uh, to help people with the same uh, disorder, uh, get information, uh, get advice, uh, look up data. And I continue to experiment with various extracts and supplements to see how they affect me, to see if one day I could uh, cure the illness. Being a programmer gave me the tools and the confidence that I needed to solve my puzzle. But really, I just took something that I knew and I applied it to something, to the problem I was facing. And that seemed to work out. Thanks for letting me share my story with you.